here at the Austin Game Developers Conference. I'm with Gavin Lonhurst. His company is Big World Technology. And you guys create a middleware, which is basically a massive multiplayer online RPG game engine, correct? That's absolutely correct, yes. We make an MMO game engine for virtual worlds, MMOs, uh, and this year we're talking about uh, Big World in a browser. So we were able to put exactly the same uh, DirectX uh, features that we have in our, our standalone uh, middleware into a browser, so now supports you know, Explorer, Firefox, um, and Chrome. So it can support all the major browsers? No, all major browsers, on, on PC, yeah, on Windows PC. So we're able to, uh, yeah, compile once, but, but using in different platforms, you know, you can put it into a, a portal, we can put it in Facebook. Um, it's, it's designed to capture that, you know, social gaming or portal gaming. Um, you don't have to have, you know, a two, two gigabyte or a 10 gigabyte download that's a standalone experience. You can have a much more modest, um, uh, uh, modestly pitched uh, game feature coming down to yeah to a browser. So yeah, capture that whole browser and web-based experience. Now there's several other types of uh, uh, engines that are aimed at developers of online games. Yours is actually uh, a little bit different because you have multiple uh, companies have already used it to create commercial quality games. Right. So uh, when we started out, which was you know around around 2000. Uh, there were, you know, middleware was for games was, was a fairly young business. There were some, you know, big hitters on the block, people like Unreal, and uh, we went. We decided to go for a very, a fairly specialized uh, vertical, which was online or massively online games. So, you know, there's plenty of uh, middleware and other game engines out there that do do multiplayer. You know, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, or sixty-four. But not a whole lot for online. For, for really big stuff. So there was a couple that came later on, but I think we wanted the first, or maybe the first two. Uh, to really specialize in, in MMOs, some online worlds and virtual worlds as well, but, but mostly MMOs. Uh, and when we, when we started out, we're an Australian-based company. I, I live here in the US, but uh, uh, a lot of the, one of, one of the big territories that was really getting heavily online then was, um, was China, China and, and Taiwan. And they were going from a, um, a legacy situation where they had a lot of 2D and 2.5D games, um, and they wanted to go to 3D. So we had uh, our, our network server technology, the Big World server, um, and we started building out the Big World 3D engine as well. And we had a, a lot of very early success in, in China um, and Taiwan, and then, then branched out into, uh, into the rest of the world, the US, uh, companies like you know, 38 Studios. Uh, at the show here, we've got uh, a couple of games um, on display. Uh, one of the big ones here is, is gonna be World of Tanks from Wargaming, and there's some guys from Belarus um, we spend a lot of time and bought a lot of love and know a lot about tanks and so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tank MMO. Um, so you know, you've got traditional RPGs, traditional uh, meat and potatoes, MMOs if you like, uh, and now we're, we're starting to see more you know, specialized um, MMOs and experiences coming out. Everyone wants to own their own niche. You know, if everyone wants to go out and compete against World of Warcraft, uh, that's, that's, that's a big uh, title to try and overcome, but if you, if you choose um, you know, a, a group or an IP that is um, something you can really, really dominate, then I think you've got a better chance of success. A more unique model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not everyone can be World of Warcraft. You know, I mean, how many swords and sorcery MMOs can you make? And unless you're trying to differentiate it, or there's something key with your IP, you know, you've got like 30 years you've just got, you know, Top of Parlin, Ari Salvatore, and Kurt Schilling uh, as the sort of creative minds and design minds uh, behind some of their IP. That uh, you know that has a very very good chance of being a major differentiator because of the the quality of the visuals and the the, the, the quality of the narrative and the, the depth of the storyline um, and obviously you know they've spent a lot of time and a lot of money uh, trying to cook up something uh, that is yeah going to use those those threads to put something together that's more unique than you might otherwise see. Now uh, for your pricing structure, you have a very flexible plan. You have a plan for indies. You have a plan for um, sort of not I wouldn't say small but medium size uh, <coughs> growth market. Yeah, so we uh, we've been selling a commercial uh, license for a number of years, six or seven years now. Um, uh, something that we've obviously seen in the last couple of years um, is both a sort of growth and competition at uh, sort of entry level stuff. But also uh, there's been a lot of people laid off in the industry, in the games industry in general, you know, we hear about it a lot. Um, and I think what we're seeing is, is that very much uh, in some areas, 
this reversion to the village model of game development. You know, two guys in a basement or a bedroom, or two guys, four guys in a garage. These garage outfits were able to, you know, maybe they've, they've built games or they've worked for larger games companies before. And they've recently laid off or the, the game company dissolved. And, you know, you can go back and join a larger game company or a large game company, or they can try and strike out on their own. And one of the areas we're seeing this in is, uh, is social gaming. So social games are one of the great levelers. Uh, you're able to get access to these huge volumes of market uh, without having to go through a traditional publisher game developer role. Um, you know, Facebook takes a card or using the currency system or whatever, but you're suddenly able to go to extreme notoriety and, and get your message way, way out there with relatively modest investment in, um, in market. Obviously, to do it well, you've got to have a bigger company and, and start using uh, to promote your game, you know, services that are out there. But, uh, you know, you hear it all the time, these, these small two, four, six guys get together, create a good kernel of a concept, um, and are able to, to access these new markets. And so one of the things we wanted to do with uh, the big world in a browser stuff is you can make a high-featured Grand Royale, you know, a Swords and Sorcery MMO or a tank MMO, something that, you know, a lot of artwork, a lot of man hours, a lot of development time. But the same core infrastructure that we developed with, with Big World can be used for a much, much more modest, you know, um, but multiplayer or massively multiplayer mechanic. Um, and so, yeah, getting, getting Big World into a browser allows you to access those, those new methods and, uh, of, of distribution with, with social networks. And uh, as for a pricing, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for commercial is it's a full featured engagement with, with Big World, so that includes training and, uh, and support, new versions, new features, features on demand, stuff like that. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, for entry level, we, we launched an indie product at uh, GDC this year at, in San Francisco, and that's, uh, that's in the order of a few hundred dollars. Um, and it's designed for, for people who want to either investigate it as indies, build an indie game, and they don't want to use one of the other available technologies at that, that entry level because they don't have uh, the big world back end. They don't have the server, they don't have, you know, they haven't been bulletproofed by deployment in, in real game uh, environments. Um, the next thing we're going to release, sort of the next rung up from that, if you like, is a thing called uh, Big World uh, Indie Source. And this is a, a more source rich version, and that's going to be out, you know, Q4 uh, this year. And, uh, We'll allow greater flexibility, um, and the next step from that, you can upgrade at any point to the next one up, and the next one up will be commercial. Yeah, so we're trying to basically uh, hit all ends of the market. You know, for, for the last nine years or so, we've been telling people who are coming to us and wanting to, to use our software for building a game basically for free that we had no solution. And that's because, you know, we were trying to build out what we have, and we only had so many hours in the day to support um, customers we were engaged with. And when we realized that, that once our documentation was at a certain level, a lot of the indies didn't actually want support. They simply wanted access to the stuff. And if you have enough of a, a critical mass, a critical density of those indie developers, that they're, they're effectively supporting themselves. Um, and so you get this great sense of community and people help each other out and they're swapping models. And, and uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to watch that unfold out of something you build. Yeah. So a uh, significant so part of your business model is really focused on trying to uh, bring indies up, get the technology, get them access to it, so that uh, we have a relationship with them for years and years. years. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it is a self-interest mechanism. I mean, the you know the indies of today are either going to do one or two things: they're going to succeed with their game and, and try and grow it, or they're going to keep their game at a at a particular um, level for the community that they've decided to build. Maybe they only want a boutique thing with a few hundred people involved, or a few thousand people. In which case, it's it's you know it's not that different from a major hobby or a major bulletin board somebody might operate or something like that. But if, if as you see with you know, many indies um, developed and launched successful games, the next game they want to do is a little bit more ambitious or a little bit bigger in scope or a little deeper. Um, and using Big World as the framework, they've got the scope to, to make you know, a small massive multiplayer online trampoline paintball game. Or they can, uh, you know, they can go the next step and, and, and try and scope out a, a bigger title, a more complex title. But the framework itself will work from, uh, you know, the low end right, right through. So yeah. So uh, on the subject again of, of indies, your art assets right now you import them through Studio, uh, Studio Max and 
that program not so familiar with? Yeah, so we, <coughs> Big Well, across all versions, has, uh, has exporters for 3D Studio Max and for, for Autodesk Maya. Um, obviously, Indies at a certain entry level, at a certain entry level have, um, have cost constraints, and so that's why we pitched our product relatively low. Uh, one thing that, that we've been remiss in doing this year, we've had a lot of other features coming out, was building a Collada exporter for it. So we're working on that, and the idea is to get that out as soon as possible to dovetail into that low-end offering so that you could use packages such as uh, Blender and Milkshake and anything else, hopefully, that supports Collada, um, as well as Max and Maya. And so it basically gives those indies uh, access to lower cost tools so they can bring in um, their own assets rather than having to use you know, um, software they don't own or, or uh, older versions or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's Blender and, and things like Milkshake have come along in a, in a big way. I mean, Blender's now being used in, in small indie films and stuff, so yeah. Yeah, so uh, part of that, that indie ecosystem at the entry level is is, is having accessibility to um, to a software pipeline that will allow you to get the app there. Um, and that's, that's one of the major sort of keys missing in, in that indie offering to begin with. Yeah. So you clearly got a lot of customers who are uh, big studios. You've got Stargate Online, uh, and you got World of Tanks, you've got uh, Grandia Online, and then Heroes. How many people are really taking advantage of the indie stuff that it's not really seen on the website? So I mean, over the years, we've, we've you know, there's, there's, we got dozens and dozens of commercial licenses out there either being developed or we got a, you know, a dozen games launched. So we're, we're looking at, um, you know, we expect it to be in the hundreds probably in the first year. And uh, I, I mean, I never really expected it to be, you know, an enormous groundswell. But it's <clears throat> at hundreds. It's a segment that, that you know we expect that out of you know out of a thousand given development houses. You might get a few dozen who are really hardcore about it and, and really um, strive, have a good work ethic, and, and have systems in place that allow them to communicate. Um, and, you know, yeah. So we, we, we're probably looking at a couple of thousand over the first few years. I would say. But we can expect most of them to actually launch into at least the beta. I can't. I can't speak as to to how many of these indies will will, will ever get to launch. Remember the. Even with middleware, not just ours, but other middleware packages, you save an amount of time and an amount of money in not and, and a huge amount of risk in not having to build stuff yourself. So that's that's basically the the reason you would engage with with middleware, not just ours, but anyone's to some extent, is that you're you're looking to save time or expense, and a lot of it is is risk and uncertainty. Okay, so there's lots of people can build a renderer, but the the number of people uh, that can build a really solid, uh, massively, you know, serving massive numbers of people infrastructure backend is actually a much reduced number. It's a much smaller subset of available sort of development resources that can build that. So, when you're engaging with something like Big World or other middleware, um, those are the things you're, you're, you're trying to buy. And, and with a, with an indie over time. Um, most of the projects we're dealing with are, are two, three, and four years sometimes. That's with middleware. It takes, if you want to build something, you know, even one of the islands of World of Warcraft, you're talking about hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of man hours of art assets and sound and designers and everything else. And so while we want to give these tools uh, uh, to the Indian, the entry level, and, and, and emerging business groups that, that want to mess around with, uh, Huge scale capability. Uh, you really got to adjust your heights, uh, your sights to within the the means of your bit of your business or your endeavor. So, you, if you've only got two artists and two programmers and one design guy, you're not going to be able to implement uh, World of Warcraft in your lifetime unless you're um, like doing nothing else for the next 20 years. Because you know, there's, there's, there was hundreds of people that went into something like that title. It took them a number of years to get it right. Um, and then there's been a lot of content for them ever since. And so, what we expect to see is um, is, is what people can do with a, a much um, more reduced uh, human footprint in their companies. And I think that's what's most interesting because there's plenty of game mechanics that can use um, you know less assets. You know, one of the, the great things that that stops uh, a tool chain is it's producing all this artwork. If you can't pay for it, you can't outsource it, and you can't produce it yourself. 
you've got to be more inventive in how you think about how your environment's constructed or if using other applications like speed tree and stuff in forests. So yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting couple of years to watch what, what comes out. Out of the stuff I've seen that some of our engineers are doing, um, the quality uh, of what they're doing is on par with a lot of high-end stuff I've seen. It was the assets they bring in. And, but, um, but to make quantity, to actually populate a large world, uh, yeah, unless it's mostly trees and mountains and stuff, you, you've really got to get clever with um, how much of that stuff you're producing. One of the things that the big world does is you allow um, kind of a cookie cutter approach to building dungeons and towns and, and buildings and cities is once you have you know a number of assets set out you can actually arrange them like Lego bricks um, and, uh, and actually make lots of you know interior dungeon or castle wall kind of content very very quickly by using these snap together you know T-junctions and, and left, left leaning passageways and, and build out a lot of content very very quickly reusably and then you can play around with lighting and, and, and you know, other debris and, and crates uh, to, to, to dress it up a bit. Yeah. So it, it's really something that uh, it's not going to make the game for you, but it'll save you a lot of time and money if yeah. you take advantage of the license. So like, like I said, with any middleware that you're, you're going to look at engaging with, you're, uh, you, know, you don't have to build a render, you don't have to build mouse controls, you don't have to build database structures, you don't have to build... Um, you know the network backend and the animation tool chain, and you know all browsers, the browser support, support, all that stuff. The you know after you read the documentation and or get trained if, if that's what you're doing on the commercial side, um, you've got your game design in place. You know the, the first week of work is the first week of work on the game, not building like where do we put our repository of stuff and how we're getting animation from this package into the game, and, and where's our lighting system? It's 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 that kind of saving. You know, directly putting it in, the first line of code you put in can be seen in the build you know, that day and you can start running around inside it. So there's there's a lot less uh, divorce and confusion from where your product is going because you've got that tight feedback loop on, I can see it right away. Thank you so much for the interview. I Absolutely. really appreciate it. Great talking to you. Looking very forward to seeing uh, what comes of the indie scale of things. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time.